The Lord's Supper. What is it? In baptism, Jesus makes the first move to counter our skeptical attitudes by giving us his promise in something more than words. In the second sacrament, the Lord's Supper, he does it again, placing his promise in simple earthly elements, bread and wine. He calls this his New Testament. The word testament is key to understanding the Lord's Supper. So why is Jesus giving us a testament? At the Last Supper, nearing his death, he announced his last will and testament as a way of giving what he had to his heirs. So here are a few more questions. Who are his heirs and what will they receive as an inheritance? The first question holds something of a surprising twist, but paying close attention here will help you understand the inheritance. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. As the following hours unfolded, by the end, not one disciple stood up for Jesus. They deserted him and sinned against him. And so we begin the Lord's Supper by saying, on the night he was betrayed. Here's the twist though. The people Jesus names as heirs are those who desert him, betray him, sin against him. Now we have a better understanding of the inheritance. When Jesus was crucified, all his possessions were taken away from him. He had only one thing left to give, his promise of forgiveness. And that's what's happening in the Lord's Supper. When you receive the bread and the wine and hear the words of promise, as Jesus gave us to say them, you receive Jesus' last will and testament. You are a betrayer. He chooses to be an heir of his estate, the promise of forgiveness. Now, having been chosen to be an heir to a great inheritance, Luther understood and wanted you to understand one more thing. We cannot change the words of a last will and testament, not what they say and not what they mean. To do so undermines the inheritance itself. And so Luther entered into one of the greatest disputes in the history of the church. When Christ said, this is my body, this is my blood, did he really mean it? Luther's answer to that question was clear. Is means is. As Luther put it, for as Christ's lips speak and say, so it is. He cannot lie or deceive. Therefore, as Lutherans, we believe this is my body, this is my blood, for the forgiveness of sin means what it says. This is most certainly true. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. This is the seventh Sunday of Easter. This is the last Sunday of the Easter season. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one that has great meaning for me. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in the sermon today. But um, uh, the day after or the week after the seventh Sunday of Easter is Pentecost. And um, let's see, that's not what I was looking for. Getting ahead of myself here. Well, let's do the birthdays since they're here. Uh, we have birthdays this week. Uh, Bryce Klein and Hope Doremus, uh, Mason Essie and Savannah Essie, and then a bunch of anniversaries. Uh, Sue Ann and B Bill Martin, 
Joe and Kathy Isbell, Chris and Nicole Sparks, and Cody and Janice Stegemuller. So happy birthday and happy anniversary to you. Uh, today, we have the, um, the, the fish fry for the volunteer uh, fire department up at uh, uh, Melody Oaks. Y'all are encouraged to go and, uh, and support our fire department. They, they love to have you there, and it's a wonderful thing to do to celebrate the fact that this is not only the seventh Sunday after Easter, but Mother's Day. So, um, and this didn't come out for some reason. We've got uh, um, confirmation coming up next week. That's what I was driving at. Uh, I thought was going to be the next slide, and it kind of moved to the end here. We have confirmation on the, on the day of Pentecost. So all our kids that have been going through confirmation program for the last two years are going to be having their uh, their their the right of confirmation next week. So I encourage you all to come back and uh, and support them uh, as they as they have that uh, that that ceremony in the, uh, for where they uh, profess their faith as as now members of the congregation, full voting members of the congregation. So um, that, and that is it that I believe that I have here for for announcements, other than to merely say. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, and, and welcome to, to, to all the guests who are here today. I uh, believe that's it. Any other things that need to get mentioned? All right. Pardon? Baccalaureate, yes. Baccalaureate is on also on next Sunday on the 20th at 6 o'clock for the, uh, the baccalaureate service for, for our graduating seniors uh, at the... Uh, uh, at the high school. So, anything else that I forgot? All right, if not, let us uh, rise and begin our worship with our opening song, which is uh, Be Thou My Vision. make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O King of glory and Lord of countless angels, in triumph you ascended to the highest heaven. Abandon us not to be orphans, but keep your Father's promise to send your spirit of truth. You live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness. We lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we 
But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. For thus says the Lord, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be made clean. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone, and will give you a heart of flesh. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this house and for all who worship here, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. the Lord for his great glory and power. Praise the Father on I, the ruler of all. Come worship the God who divided day from the night. Thank the Lord for making the world and filling our days with his light. Come worship the Lord for his love, mercy, and grace. Praise the Son who has come to show us his face. Come worship the God who has bled, suffered, and died. Thank the Lord for giving his life a spotless and pure sacrifice. Come Worship the Lord, the Spirit, just, holy, and true. Praise Him for the gift of faith and life that is new. Come, worship the Lord, for He lives in glory divine. Praise the one who will reign from now and all time. Come, Worship the God who is here, called us his own. Thank the Lord to whom we belong, and lift up our prayer and our song.
may be seated. And will the children come down here, please? Where is everybody? I know you're here. <laughs> come on, kids. Good morning. How are you guys today? Where are my buddies? Come on down. Yay, you made it. Boom, you got it? Okay. Okay, no problem. Well, how is everybody today? What is today? What is Mother's Day. Mother's Day. That's your mom. Yes, you love your mom. Yes. That is your mother's day. Yes. It's my mother's day and my roommate's mother's day. Wonderful. Good job. Yes. Yes, so everybody's going to treat their moms real special today, right? Yeah, that's his guitar. Okay. That's his guitar. So, yes, so remember, thank your mom today for everything that she does for you. Because there's nothing mom won't do for you, right? Right, right, no, no. Mummies do everything for our children, don't they? Yeah. Be because why? Mummy gave you that. Right. And, oh, I'm sorry. It'll get better, okay? Okay. As my mom always says, by the time you get married, you'll forget all about it. So, <laughs> so yes. So, who else loves us? Don't Me. Think Yes, but who else loves us more than our moms? Jesus. Jesus, right. And, and like our moms, does Jesus ever leave us? No. 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 But our moms, we can see our moms because our moms are always with us, right? Can we see Jesus? We know he's in our heart and we know he's with us, but we can't see him, right? Because... Because physically, meaning with his body, he's not here. And that's what our lesson says today. It says, I will remain in the world no longer. That means he went up to heaven. But they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. That means we are still here. And he's going to come back to us someday, right? So Jesus asks his father, which is God, to protect us by the power of his name. So even though Jesus isn't here with us, he's, he's still with us. Now, does anybody here like to do puzzles? Me. You like to do puzzles? You like to do puzzles? Do you ever do mazes? Do you know what a maze is? No, not me. This is what a maze is. That's what a maze is. You've done one of those in school. I've seen you do those. Have you ever worked on any of these kinds of puzzles? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's got a whole bunch of different lines in it with a whole bunch of different ways you can go. And you've got to start from one point and end up at another. But in the maze, it can lead you to all kinds of dead ends and wrong places to turn, right? Well, how do we find our way through a maze if we get lost? How do we find our way through a maze if we get lost? Oh, you can sneak by the bad wolf? Yeah. And who protects you from the bad wolf? Jesus. Jesus. You are so right. Good answer. Yeah, but we're yes. not Jesus. No, no. Jesus protects us from the bad wolf, right? Right. So, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. okay, sit down for yeah, a minute, honey. Yes, get your envelope, get your envelope. So sometimes our life feels like a maze. Sometimes we go through life and we feel lost, and we don't know which direction to turn, right? But who can help us through our life and through our maze? Jesus. Jesus. So even though we feel lost and we feel alone sometimes, we're never lost and we're never alone. All we need to do is pray to Jesus and he will help us through that maze 
and he will help us through our life. Just like our mom helps us through, helps you through, helps Ozzy and Kenna through, and And, he, and, and, and mom helps you through your life, right? Yes. So let's say a prayer of thanks. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for leading us through this maze of our life. And whenever we get lost, we don't need to be afraid because we know you will lead us to the other end of that maze, which is to be with you in heaven forever and ever. In your name we pray, amen. First lesson is from the first chapter of Acts, beginning at the twelfth verse. If the, if the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away, and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of the persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, al that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who had accompanied us during the time that the Lord Jesus was in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph called Basabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the ministry in this, take the place in this ministry and apostleship to which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Here ends the first reading. We'll read Psalm 1 by whole verses. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of the sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful.
They are like trees planted by the streams of water, bearing fruit in due season. With leaves they do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 5, beginning of the ninth verse. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, he who has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Here in three. <laughs> Our gospel for this day is from the 17th chapter of John. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have, you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Now, I don't expect that you remember this, but uh, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned in the past that, uh, that the, the seventh Sunday of Easter, especially the gospel text from this cycle of the lectionary, which is year B in the lectionary, uh, is of some special meaning to me. Each year on the seventh Sunday of Easter, we get to read through roughly a third of uh, the 17th chapter of John which is Jesus' great high priestly prayer. 
It's the last prayer that, that Jesus spoke on earth that is recorded, unless you count the words he spoke from the, from the cross as prayer. But this reading and the, the related Sunday of the church here is burned into my mind because it, because it is the day and the text that, that finally convinced me that I had to leave my former denomination. I've talked about this to people as being my own personal Reformation Day of sorts. Uh, and, and that's kind of a big deal to speak of things in, in, in those terms for a person who is a, a lifelong Lutheran and a bit of a theology geek. Uh, it was that significant to me because of what my former pastor preached on this, on this text or about this text on this Sunday, 12 years ago. She read this text that I just read to you, and then she be began her sermon with the words that Pilate would say to Jesus just a few hours after he prayed this prayer. What is truth? And then she began to talk about how the truth is relative. Oh, I wish I had a recording of that, of that sermon so I could go back and listen to it. And uh, I'm sure that I would have several really bad examples that I could give you uh, that would detail how I got more and more disappointed as the sermon went on and then I got angry. I was thinking that, that perhaps this, this, uh, this method or of preaching that she was doing was going to be some kind of a, a, a satiristic exercise and that she was going to come around to the eternal truth that shatters this false secular idea that is so common in our culture now, the idea of moral relativism, and then end with, with a rebuke of this idea as sinful and a call to repentance and the sweet salve of the gospel that promises forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. But she didn't. And when I later confronted her with this, she doubled down on this enthusiast's idea that we, we can't discount the idea that, uh, that God may be revealing something new in these days. This in spite of of the clear testimony of scripture that nothing that contradicts the word of God will ever be a new truth. So I won't bore you with the, with the struggle that ensued in that congregation as a result of that sermon being the straw that broke the camel's back. But it was more than one sermon. It was the slow drip, drip, drip of, of studies on, on, on sexuality that sought to undo the word of God. Uh, it was the, the idolization of a very tiny proof text that was in our gospel reading today as well. That phrase, that they may be one. I've heard that before, right? Uh, they took this idea that they may be one and it, it's, it's not... The idea of this, this, this unified church, you know, it is indeed a good Lutheran one, as I'll explain in a moment. But the, but the heavy emphasis on what was known as the, the ecumenical movement in the church rose to the level of idolatry. See, there were agreements that were hammered out by, by delegations from the Lutheran church to other denominations that, that looked for all the world to be much like the diplomatic corps that works within the State Department, creating treaties and, and or other international trade deals. But within the church, you see, these deals that brought about altar and pulpit fellowship arrangements required one denomination to acquiesce to the other on important points of doctrine. Something that, that Lutherans traditionally had not been willing to do. In fact, our ancestors left Germany to come here because 
the, the rulers of Germany were forcing churches to merge so that they could have a unified church in their kingdom. That idea of a vis visibly unified church is one that goes back a long way. That was a serious enough problem for people to leave everything behind as our ancestors left Germany and came to the wilderness of Texas or Missouri or Minnesota or the Dakotas or some other places. Some even went to Australia. For us to come to agreements by giving in on the truth that is revealed in Scripture is to put aside the gospel of truth in pursuit of this ideal of a visible unity. Now, I said that, that unity in the church is a good, good Lutheran idea, right? And here's how. One of our foundational documents in the Lutheran church is called the Augsburg Confession. It's called that because the, the, the German city of Augsburg is where the German princes came to appear before the emperor and to present this document that describes how the theology of the Lutheran churches is clearly and completely based on the word of God. That nothing that we did or taught was in conflict with scripture. Well, Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession is a definition of what unity in the church is. And it says, speaking of the Lutherans and their teachings, that one holy church is to continue forever. The church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. And in the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree concerning the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. Nor is it necessary that human traditions, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be everywhere alike. As Paul says, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So it is a very Lutheran idea that there is already unity in the church. Because the true church is not some perfect denomination or the biggest collection of ecumenical agreements. No, rather it is where you find these things. The congregation of the saints in which there is the right teaching of the gospel and the right administration of the sacraments. It is enough. That's my primary calling as pastor, to a ministry of word and sacrament. Here in this sanctuary, and in the course of pastoral care in people's homes, or at bedsides in hospitals or nursing homes. So Jesus prays this prayer, asking that we may be one. He says that we have been given the word of truth. He prays that we be sanctified in the truth. Now, confirmation is next Sunday, as I said, on the day of Pentecost. So I could call on one of my, uh, my confirmation kids to, to tell me what uh, the definition of sanctified is, right? Now I won't do that. <laughs> sanctified simply means to be set apart. To be, to be set apart particularly for God. For us to be set apart in the truth is a pretty great place to be. For it is there that we find our relationship to that truth. It is there that we find our sinfulness. The truth convicting us in God's law. It is for this sinfulness that we deserve eternal punishment. And it is there in that truth that we also find the gospel. The good news that Jesus has redeemed us. The good news that he paid our insurmountable debt for those sins. The truth that he has provided us with the sustenance of his word and the refreshment that only comes from the sacraments. And the good news that instead 
of giving us what we deserve. He grants us eternal life and joy in his presence. Now that is a truth that is worth fighting for. For to go chasing after idols of our own imagination is to leave that gospel behind. Now I'll close by paraphrasing the heart of our second lesson today from 1 John chapter 5. And, it, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. I proclaim these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. In Jesus name. Amen. Be please rise for the singing of our uh, hymn of the day, Christ has made the sure foundation. faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, in the pages of Holy Scripture, you reveal your salvation. Guide our efforts at proclaiming your word. Thwart the plans of all who desire to prevent your kingdom from extending to the lost. Bring to joyful fruition the gospel seeds planted by missionaries, pastors, teachers, and all your people. Lord, in your mercy. Look with favor, O God, upon all our mothers. Guide them as they serve you in caring for their children. Ease their anxieties as they perform daily parenting responsibilities. Bring them joy in the privilege of nurse, nurturing their children. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, you earnestly desire the spiritual unity of your Christian church. Keep us firm in the truth of your word. Make our association, its congregations, and its members bold confessors of the true faith. Strengthen us against the temptation to be conformed to the spirit of the times. And keep us faithful in the proclaiming of the joy of your salvation to those around us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, through your servant John, you gave us a glimpse into life everlasting. With John's testimony, comfort those who suffer those undergoing medical treatments, and those homebound. Especially this day, we pray, we pray for Ruth and Arik Wasilas, for the Mason family, for Emery Milgrad, Larry Schwartz, Shirley Bailey, Leroy Neiman, Harold Kruger, Harriet Fisher, Lester Gieslin, Christy Wells, Caroline Martin, Fred Hartley, Ray Hammond, Robbie Russell, Ethel Shane, Annie Hodges, J.C. Parton, Lorena Schwartz, Judy Pox, Victor and Elnora Limmer, Gladys Strempler, Wilfred Strempler, and all those we bring before you in our hearts are allowed at this time. Bring to their minds the assurance that 
even in their current afflictions, they can continue to look forward with eager joy to the place where no lamp or sun is needed, for the Lord God will be their everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, your Son promises that he is the resurrection and the life, that whoever believes in him will live eternally. Dear graciously, deal graciously with those who mourn the death of loved ones. Lead them to take refuge in your Son's promises, that they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's now pray together boldly the words our Savior gave us to pray. Our Father, our Lord, Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.